I'd also like to introduce my HSD colleagues. Um, there's Eliana Benitez, who's doing the slide presentation. There's Karen Valle, who's doing the chat, and Natalie Sharkey, who um, is going to present on the race and social index tool and our theory of change. And then Judith Penn-Lasigi, who's the manager of MODVSA, will be presenting on the scoring parts of the presentation. Okay, next slide. Welcome again, um, and for a roll call and attendance, please stay muted and use the chat function to introduce yourself. All information shared in the chat box will be included in the notes for today's meeting. Um, we'd like you to put your name and preferred pronouns Feel free to refrain from introductions if you don't wish to have this information be recorded or included in the meeting notes. Um, please also put down your agency, um, the department you're in, and your role um, or your title. And then we'll have designated times throughout the session for questions and answers. But at the, at the very moment, you could um, actually put questions in the chat as they come up, and then we can call on you at the time that we'll actually do our question and answer session. Next slide, please. With every presentation we do, we like to um, do a land and labor acknowledgement to recognize that we're currently occupying the unceded lands of many First Peoples, Coast Salish people, Muckashoot, Squamish, Stillaguamish, and Duwamish. We acknowledge and thank local First Nations for their centuries of land stewardship that long predate the arrival of European settlers. We honor those who are still struggling for recognition and reparations for historical acts of genocide and ongoing, ongoing erasure. We remind you to be aware of the spaces you occupy locally and these lands were stolen from the first people in the name of white settler colonialism and that you seek ways to continue your education and give back to local indigenous community. And one way you can do that is through the Duwamish tribes website, um, which is http www.duwamishtribes.org. Duwamishtribe.org. Um, we also must acknowledge that much of which, what we know of this country today, including its culture, economic growth, and development throughout history and across time, has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans and their ascendants who suffered the horror of the transatlantic trafficking of their people, chattel slavery, and Jim Crow. We are indebted to their labor and their sacrifice, and we must acknowledge the tremors of that violence throughout the generations and the resulting impact that can be still felt and witnessed today. That's from Dr. Tara T.J. Stewart. Next slide, please. This is also an announcement um, that everything that's in this presentation and the applications that you submit to us are a matter of public record and can be disclosed. Um, and you can actually see more information at the confidentiality and conflict of interest statement that's on the website, um, the HSD website. And please let us know if there's any reason why your identity needs to be, remain private for safety reasons. Next slide, please. This is our session agenda. Part one is the introduction, the timeline um, of the RFP, the background and requirements of the of the question and answers, the HSD theory of change, the technical assistance that we'll be offering you. And at the very end of the part one of our session, we'll be doing questions and answers. Um, and just so you know, the part one it will be going through the application process up until submission. Next slide. So this is just a little introduction to HSD's 2024 Gender-Based Violence Prevention Services RFP, which, which is an open and competitive funding process. Um, approximately 487,560 is available through HSD's general fund from this JBB Prevention Services RBB, RFP. Initial awards will be made for the period of January 1st, 2025 through December 31st, 2025. Next slide, please. This is our complete RFP timeline. The funding opportunity was announced on April 1st, 2024. Today is our virtual information session. The help sessions will occur between April 8th and 2024 to May 30th, 2024. And that's the technical assistance part. 
The last day to submit questions is May 13th by noon, and the application deadline is also Friday, May 31st, 2024 at noon. Please note that these are not end of day um, application deadline or application um, submitting questions deadline. Review and rating process will occur from June 8th to 2024 to July 12th, 2024, and the award announcement will be on July 29th, 2024. The appeal process will take place on August 12th and the contract start date is January 1st, 2025. Next slide, please. This is just an overview of the background and program requirements. And when you see the page number, that reflects the page number and the guideline and application of the RFP. So we'll be having an overview. Um, we'll be talking about the service and program models, the service components of the strategies, participant eligibility, priority and focus populations, um, performance commitments, and key staffing um, as part of your programs. Next slide, please. Um, the overview of investment area is that the 2024 GBV Prevention Services RFP aligns with HSD's Safe and Thriving Communities Division's goals and principles in eliminating racial disparities, promoting equity for all, and supporting communities to thrive. Next slide, please. Here's just a basic definition of gender-based violence. Um, and I'm sure that most of you know this definition, but we wanted to go over it for anybody that might not be familiar. Gender-based violence is a term that generally refers to any harmful threat or act directed at a group based on actual or perceived sex, gender identity, sex characteristics, or sexual orientation. Gender-based violence encompasses interpersonal violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and commercial sexual exploitation. Gender-based violence is rooted in historical and ongoing structural inequalities, the abuse of power and harmful norms and practices. Gender-based violence is compounded by the intersecting forms of discrimination and bias, and GBV has serious and long-lasting negative impacts on individuals, families, communities, and society. Next slide, please. And just so you all know, there is conflation of prevention sometimes with intervention and response. So we'd like to clarify that this is about primary prevention. GBV primary prevention focuses on strategies that address the root cause of violence to prevent violence before it occurs. It addresses multiple risk factors for gender-based violence, increases the likelihood of violence occurring, um, and increases protective factors, characteristic that reduce the likelihood of GBV occurring, and it fosters safe environments and resilient communities, and it has an intersectional approach. How does gender identity and non-conforming to gender identity increase the risk of violence? Um, things that are shaped by race, class, sexual identity, and disability. Next slide, please. Here is the socio-ecological model and GBV prevention. The risk factors for gender-based violence occur at all four levels of the socio-ecological model. And if you see this chart, um, violence doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs at many different levels. Uh, and um, there are environmental factors that um, can cause gender-based violence um, on the societal level, the community level, um, the interpersonal level, which is in our relationships, and also in the individual level. And then all prevention strategies should strengthen protective factors at all levels, individual relationship and community levels, um, and at the societal level whenever possible. Next slide, please. Service program models. Um, uh, the purpose of this RFP is to address the root causes of gender-based violence, shift social and cultural beliefs and norms, build skills and promote healthy relationships to prevent gender-based violence before it occurs. The two st service strategies included in this RFP are educational program for youth, ages 10 to 18, which is education and training for youth on healthy relationship skills using approaches that focus on behavior change. And the second is building community resilience, um, which is for all ages. It's community-led activities designed to address and change social norms and conditions 
in which gender-based violence happens and in a context that's relevant, effective, and meaningful to community needs. And just so everyone knows, all applicants are um, can apply to more than one strategy. They don't have to just, um, you know, have their application just be one or the other. Next slide, please. Okay, the first strategy, educational program for youth, ages 10 to 18, will invest in gender-based violence primary prevention youth programs that are shown to increase safety and protection against future violence. Competitive proposal will include age-appropriate educational programming that provides healthy relationship skill building and increases positive support networks. Activities can be implemented in partnership with other entities, such as schools, healthcare, social services, nonprofit organizations, faith based organizations, and community based organizations. Next slide. Educational program for youth. These are um, some of the activities that we are um, recommending to promote gender equity and positive gender norms. Um, such as raising awareness about social norms and the nuances of power and control, harmful stereotypes, build healthy relationship skills, such as understanding consent and the necessity of boundaries and relationships, that they are accessible culturally and linguistically to the community being served. They involve youth in planning and implementation. They strengthen or increase protective factors that positively impact youth safety. They impact individual relationship, community, and societal level change. That's from the socio-ecological model. Develop a process to collect and track related to activities and use data to continually improve implementation of those activities. Next slide, please. Here are some suggested activities. Um, they're not prescriptive and they're not all-encompassing. Um, they would be things like peer mentorship, engagement of adults in reinforcing positive relationship expectations. They'd be inclusive, inclusive, accessible recreational activities that promote protective factors that prevent GBV and bystander intervention. Next slide, please. This is the second strategy, which is building community resilience, which is an all ages strategy. It will invest in community led activities designed to address and change social norms and conditions in which GBV happens and in a context that's relevant, effective and meaningful to the community needs. This strategy aims to address factors relevant to the community being served and shift culture to create safer conditions for everyone in the community. Competitive proposals will show comprehensive programming that tackles the underlying or root causes of gender-based violence in the community. Therefore, proposals will also address the forms of intersection oppression and violence. Higher priority will be given to programs that are designed and led by the focus and priority populations. And we'll get to the focus and priority populations later on in the slides. Next slide, please. And then some of the activities that we are um, proposing that you use, the community driven and led by focus. They are community driven and led by focus and priority populations stated in this RFP. They promote gender equity and positive gender norms that reduce gender based violence. They're accessible and culturally linguistically relevant to the community being served. They strengthen or increase protective factors and other conditions that positively impact community safety and well-being at an individual relationship, community and or societal level. They develop processes to collect and track data related to activities and use data to continually improve implementation activities. Next slide, please. And here are some suggested activities for building community resilience, collective healing programs, Facilitation of intergenerational dialogues about gender-based violence prevention and historical trauma. Inclusive, accessible recreational opportunities such as sports, the arts, defense classes or games that promote social connectivity, empowerment, resilience, and cooperation. The list of suggested activities is not prescriptive or exhaustive. Applicants may choose their own program shown to prevent gender-based violence, and this goes to the educational programming as well. Next slide, please. 
here are some ineligible activities for program and many of you recognize um, the first few because there are response and survivor centered um, response and intervention activities, mobile flexible advocacy, legal advocacy, therapeutic services, survivor hotlines, offender accountability, batter intervention treatment, and then anything that's a one time or limited exposure activity. Um, that would be revolve around information or messaging, such as delivering a domestic violence sexual assault awareness presentation at school assemblies. Um, next slide, please. And this is also regarding participant eligibility, which is on page eight of the guidelines and application. Participants, participants may be of any gender, sexual orientation, age, race and th ethnicity and maybe domestic or foreign nationals and live, learn, work and take part in the community in Seattle. And taking part in the community in Seattle could be any number of activities, art activities, um, social organizations, um, community organizations, church, family uh, connections in Seattle. Services must be provided in the city of Seattle, prioritizing those serving in neighborhoods with the highest equity disparities as shown in the city of Seattle racial and social equity index. And now I'm going to turn it over to Natalie Sharkey, who's in part of our data performance team. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, like Michelle mentioned, my name is Natalie Sharkey. Um, I'm a senior data analyst with the human services department in the data performance and evaluation team. And so today I'm going to be going over with you the um, city of Seattle racial and social equity index. Um, I'm going to be putting two links in the chat for you all to have access to and to look at. The first is the actual um, race and social equity index viewer. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat now. The second is the user guide. So this is what you can use um, to maybe answer some questions that you might have about the social, um, the racial social equity index. Um, and also it gives you um, some information about how to use it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put that one also in this um, in the um, chat. And if you're having difficulties, I see the message from Stephanie saying you got a message saying the page is not found. Okay, well, we will work on uh, making sure that the link that we provide you, if not in here and some of the other materials, um, you can actually see. Because essentially, um, and I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so you can see what it looks like. So that first link um, is going to is actually going to take you to this. And once I, I don't know if it might be um, uh, permissions. Okay. But it says second link works. Okay, that's good. Okay, so yeah, we'll we'll make sure um, that the, this link, the link that will take you to this, you have access to. But essentially, this is the um, City of Seattle Racial and Social Equity Index. Um, essentially, what it does is it combines data on race, ethnicity, and related demographics with data on social economic disadvantages and health disadvantages. Um, the index is calculated and mapped at the census tract level to indicate where people of color and other marginalized populations make up relatively large proportions of neighborhood residents. Um, the tool is to aid in the identification of geographic priorities for city programs, planning efforts, and investments. So this is a tool that we're going to be using in all of our investment areas. Um, and, you know, that will be good for you all to, to learn about and to kind of, you know, go through once, once we make sure that the, the access to the link um, is available for you. So this, it's a, it's a map that has that's um, major that is made up of three equally weighted sub um, indices, which are the race, uh, English language and origin index. Um, 
English language learners, that's the ELL. Uh, the second one is the social economic disadvantage index. And the third is the health disadvantage index. Um, for this RFP in particular, we are looking at the social economic disadvantage index because that is made up of um, two, two data sets, which is the income below 200% of the poverty and the educational attainment less than um, a bachelor's degree. So essentially with this tool, um, you, it's a map of the city of Seattle that you can add different layers to, so that way you can see where populations lie. Um, right now, what we're looking at <clears throat> is we're looking at the social economic disadvantage portion of the index. Um, the way that you can kind of add layers to it or look at the map uh, differently is when you go to the layer section, you get um, all these different options of, of things that you can add to the map. So like I mentioned, the one that we're looking at is the social economic disadvantage in index. And the way that you know that you're looking at it is because um, the little I says visibility. Um, it doesn't have the, the line through it. Um, if it has a line through it, it means that it's the data isn't being illustrated on the map. So right now, what we can see if we look at the, the legend is that in the southern area of Seattle, so in like the Rainier Valley, <coughs> south part of Seattle, and some of the central portions of Seattle, and then even in the University District and Lake City and some other portions of Greenwood and, and up north in Seattle, that's where the highest equity proportion priority or the most disadvantage are currently at according to the census data that is being used. Um, in addition to that, like I mentioned, you can add layers to it. So another consideration that we're doing for this RFP is we're looking at children um, or we're looking at youth for, for one of the strategies. So you can add to this by um, clicking on this to see the poverty rate. Um, for children under 18 years old. And what that does is it adds this added layer um, to it so you can see where kind of these different populations are overlapping. Um, so you see that the bigger the diamond um, and the darker the color of the diamond, it means that that's where the locations are that um, these populations are located. And on top of you know, the highest equity um, priority or those that are considered most disadvantaged, you can start to see that there are um, patterns and of areas of where the these different um, categories are located in the city of Seattle. So the way that we use it in the city or in HSD is we use these these different areas to determine like where we should focus some of our, our different funding um, efforts at. So if you know you have a location or if you have um, a, a program that's going to target some of these specific areas, you know, that will really um, inform us when we're looking at all the different proposals about how how we're going to um, look at how we can serve these these different areas. So that is the racial and social equity index. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Do we have any questions for Natalie about the index? Okay, Natalie you can continue. Okay, next slide. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're gonna be talking about HSD's theory of change. <clears throat> so um, our, our HSD theory of change is based off of the results-based accountability framework developed by Mark Friedman, um, for, and it's from his book entitled, Trying Hard is Not Good Enough. Um, RBA, or results-based accountability, is a model that starts with the ends and works backwards towards the means. 
In other words, it looks at the difference that you're trying to make first, which are like the goals and the end results that you want to accomplish. And it works towards the how, the how those accomplishments are going to happen. What separates RBA from other frameworks is the population versus performance distinction, and it's a way of organizing the work. The HSD theory of change is an adaption of the RBA model, and it first leads with race. It is used within all of our funding processes and begins with population. The population is the overall group that is impacted and must encompass everyone working on the issue. Essentially, it asks, who do we want to affect, which is that first <clears throat> like blue pie part. <clears throat> Followed by that is the population accountability or the desired result, and it is the condition of well being that equals the results wanted. In other words, it finds the result we want for the population that we identified. Next are the indicators that are used to determine why the result is even needed. This also serves as the population level baseline data. The indicators are population based and race based um, that show the populations most in need. They come from reliable data sources and that are measured ongoingly. These indicators tie into our racial equity goals, which is how we work to create equity within funding processes. Once the indicators have been identified, we begin to move towards performance. The performance is the programs or organizations work and internal functions that work towards the population goals. Performance accountability or strategies and activities organizes the work to have the greatest impact on the customers. It shows what will be done to achieve the result. With performance accountability, strategies are broader while activities are more specific. After the strategies or activities are developed, performance measures get created. Performance measures are ways to know if our strategies and activities are working. It is important to note that organizations and programs can only be held accountable for the customers they serve. For programs and organizations, the performance measures focus on whether customers are better off as a result of the services provided. This is done by asking three essential questions for measurement. They are how much is done, which is the quantity, how well was it done, which is the quality, and is anyone better off, which is the impact. All of this encompasses our HSD theory of change. Next slide. So we use this to then um, <clears throat> also inform the, this uh, RFP theory of change. So for the 2024 gender-based violence prevention services theory of change, the population that we were looking at is all people who live, learn, work, and take part in community in Seattle. The priority populations, which like I mentioned, are the individuals most at risk for gender-based violence in Seattle. Women, LGBTQIA+, people living with disabilities, immigrant slash refugees, Limited English speakers and youth and young adults are all of those that are identified as our priority population. Those that identify as Black African Americans, American Indian Alaska Native, Asian American slash Pacific Islanders, and Latinx Hispanic are going to be our focus populations. And that is because of our racial disparity indicator data that I'll get to in a second. The two indicators that we used to um, to inform us are the percent of Seattle households at or below federal poverty level and the percent of Seattle adolescents with an adult they can talk with. Um, the first indicator of Seattle households at or, or below the federal poverty level by race shows us that those that identify as Black African American um, slash African descent, American Indian Alaska Native, um, are the two uh, should be some of the ones that we put particular focus on. For the percent of Seattle adolescents with an adult they can talk with by race, it'll be more of the, the smaller percentage um, because that means that they have less or they, they, they don't have um, an adult they can talk with. 
So for, for that particular indicator, we see that Hispanic Latinx, those identify as Hispanic Latinx, followed by Asian, Black, African American, African descent, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander are all the, the populations that we need to focus on. So with that, we combine the this two focus and priority population along um, with to, to equate to our population level level racial equity goals to say that the identified race um, ethnicity populations do not experience poverty and that they also have an adult that they can talk with. Those are our goals. Next slide. Okay, I think it goes back to you, Michelle. Yeah, um, as Natalie said, these are the priority populations and focus populations for the RFP. Priority populations include LGBTQIA+, youth and young adults, women, homeless and unhoused individuals, people living with disabilities, immigrants, refugees, people that are low income, limited English speakers. And priority populations are a group of groups comprising of a specific demographic who have a specific issue in common. The following populations are prioritized, especially those who experience multiple or intersecting oppressions. And then our focus populations are specific racial or ethnic groups within that priority population with data showing the highest disparities in the investment area. And those would be Black, African American, African descent, at American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Hispanic, Latinx, Asian, or Asian American. Applicants may specialize in subgroups within the focus population prop proposals that clearly describe a plan to address significant needs among, among other populations. They may also be considered. Please refer to HSD's result-based accountability and theory of change document on the HSD funding opportunity webpage. And make sure you bookmark that HSD funding opportunities webpage because you probably end up referring to it many times. Next slide, please. This is back to you, Natalie. Okay, so for the performance measures, like I mentioned in the description of the theory of change, um, we're gonna that's gonna be divided up into the three major categories of quantity, quality, and impact. So for these performance measures on the first strategy of educational programming for youth, we decided that for the quantity, it's gonna be the number of youth participating in gender-based violence prevention programs. Um, number of youth assessed or surveyed, uh, the number of gender-based violence prevention activities conducted. For the quality part, we're looking at the percent of youth who complete a gender-based violence prevention activity, the percent of youth that state that they are satisfied with the gender-based violence prevention activity. And lastly, for the impact portion of this strategy, we're looking for the percent of youth that report having two action items to present to prevent gender based violence. Next slide. For the second strategy of building community and resiliency for the quantity portion, we're looking at the number of individuals participated in gender based violence prevention programs. The number of individuals at risk for gender based violence that were assessed or surveyed the number of gender based violence prevention activities conducted for the quality section. We're looking at the percent of individuals who completed gender based violence prevention programs. The percent of individuals who state that they are satisfied with the gender based violence prevention program. And for impact, we're looking for the percent of individuals who report an increased feeling of belonging and connection to community and the percent of individuals who demonstrated an increase in gender based violence protective factors. As you notice, with both of the strategies, these um, performance measures are pretty general. And so we wanted that to happen <clears throat> to be the case. So that way you can see your own programming. Um, and, and being able to gather these different performance measures. 
And also just a quick note, I'm going to put a new link for the racial and social equity composite index for you all in the chat here. Let me know if it does or doesn't work. Thank you, Natalie. Next slide. Um, this is regarding staffing for your programs. There should be adequate number of qualified culturally and linguistically competent staff to effectively conduct the strategies outlined and activities that are proposed. Applicants are not only required to obtain training for the specific at risk populations being served in proposed program strategies, all program staff. Supervisors and volunteers must be at a minimum be familiar with the dynamics of domestic violence, sexual assault, and commercial sexual exploitation. Staff investment should be prioritized by organizations reg regarding equitable compensation and organizational support for reducing staff turnover, as well as staff burnout and secondary trauma. Staff should reflect the communities and populations served. Next slide, please. Um, and now we're uh, proud that we are actually going to be having technical assistance for all RFP applicants. We're offering technical assistance to support community based organizations applying for funds through this request for proposal. This support reflects our commitment to partnering with organizations that are grounded in the communities they serve and able to provide high quality impact services to our focus populations as well as our priority populations. MODVSA is partnering with Shannon Perez Darby, a founding member of Accountable Communities, and I'd love to actually introduce Shannon to you all. Shannon is a queer, mixed race Latina and anti violence advocate, author, activist, and consultant working to create the conditions to support loving, equitable relationships and communities. With 20 years of experience, Shannon centers queer and trans communities of color while working to address issues of domestic and sexual violence, accountability, and abolition. And next slide, I'd like to introduce Shannon Perez Darby. Hello. Thank you. The next, next slide, Ileana. <laughs> you went back, I think. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, Shannon. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, well, it's so nice to um, be here with you all. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. I don't have too much to say except so that folks could see me. Uh, you can uh, read about some of my background and work here. Uh, and my role in this process is to provide technical assistance to qualifying organizations. Um, and so I think it's either on this slide or there's a maybe another slide about it. Uh, and for folks who are interested in getting connected in the RFP, there is a link. So you're welcome to schedule time directly with me. That will uh, generate a 30 minute Zoom uh, meeting for us. And in that time, we can talk about uh, what kind of support I, I can offer, what kind of support folks are looking for and how I could best potentially support your application. That's that. Thank you so much, Shannon. I'm glad you could join us today. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the end of part one, which is not the end of our entire information information session, but I just wanted to open it up for questions, stretching, moving around. These things can be, you know, kind of onerous. So just let us know if you have any questions. And Karen, can you monitor the chat and let me know if there's any questions there? Sure. Thank you. And feel free to raise your hand as well to, to ask a question. Give you time to think and process for a few minutes, move around, stretch, whatever you need. Anything at all, Karen? No. Oh, there you go. So from <laughs> Jenny Daniel Daniels Freeze, is this funding renewable or just one time? Yeah, yes, it starts on January 1st, um, 2025 through December 2025. And normally speaking, 
funding um, will occur for the next four years um, until another RFP or RFQ process um, is initiated. Um, and it all depends on um, the funding that's available. Okay, another question from uh, George Gonzalez. In terms of the social ecological approach, are you focusing on any one section? Example, individual versus community? I think for sure we are. Um, it's really difficult for programs to make significant change on the societal level. So we're mainly focused on an individual, the interpersonal, um, but we'd like to see some impact on the community as well. Okay, thank you. And then another question from Nanet Pok. If we apply under both strategies, do we submit one or two proposals? If one, is the page limit still 10 pages? No, if you, if you submit two um, proposals, um, you'll be submitting one core part of your application, which has to do with your agency, and then two separate sections will be for each of your strategy. And then 10 pages would count for the entire application, either the first strategy or the second strategy for a total of 20 pages. Okay. And then another question from Monica Shell. Is this funding primarily intended for new projects or could it be a continuation of previous prevention projects? It's for both. Okay. And Nanet says, thank you. Yes. And yeah. Any other questions? Uh, that's it for now. Okay. Yeah, we'll have time for questions at the end as well. So, if you want to go to the next slide, Eliana. And just to note, um, official question and answers are posted on the HSD RFP funding website. Um, and here's the link. Um, please contact me, um, Michelle.smith2 at seattle.gov with questions prior to May 13th, 2024 by noon. Um, the reason why we're only giving my email is because only written published answers on the HSD funding opportunities website are official, um, but we may have a phone call if we just need to clarify your question, um, but everything will be recorded on the HSD RFP funding website, including the question and answers from today's session. Next slide, please. And here um, we're going to lead into our session agenda part two, um, which is what happens um, as you submit your application and then everything that happens to your application after that. So that would be submission instructions, review and rating process, tips for submitting your application, the appeal process, and then we'll give you time for questions at the end. Next slide, please. Okay, so we just want to reiterate again that application packets are due by 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Friday, May 31st, 2024, and that applications must be complete and on time. Proposals must be submitted to the HSD online submission system or via email. Uh, we don't accept hand delivered, faxed, or mail proposals. Um, allow ample time for uploading and confirmation of a receipt. So the submission system website is listed here. Um, and then the email for you to submit your application is listed below. Next slide, please. And the system is not an online application system. There's no saving of any applications. Um, you may um, upload files up to a maximum of 100 megabytes. Accept acceptable file types include PDF, DOC, DOCX, um, RTF, XLS, or XLSX. There are required fields to be completed, so ensure you allow sufficient time to complete the steps in order for you to submit your application by the deadline. The system automatically sends a confirmation to all email addresses you enter. Next slide, please. Complete applications, which is on page 15 of your guidelines and application RFP. Late applications will not be accepted. HSD is not responsible for insurance, ensuring that applications are received by the deadline. 
Your application must include a completed and signed application cover sheet, which is attachment to a completed narrative response, 10 page limit, a proposed program budget, attachment three in Excel, proposed personnel detail budget, attachment four in Excel, a proposing new services, a startup timeline, and signed partnership letters if needed. And just so you know, the Excel um, budget sheets are up on the HST website for funding opportunities. Next slide, please. Um, fiscal documents. Fiscal documents are just to ensure people have financial sellability and if funding is awarded, agencies for which we have current financial insurance documents will be not required to resubmit fiscal documents. But however, agencies for which we have incomplete or no financial or insurance documents will be notified by me and required to submit all requested documents within four business days from the date of written request. Financial and insurance documentation that may be requested are listed in the complete application requirements part of your application. Next slide, please. And if you have a fiscal sponsor, ensure that um, they, their fiscal sponsor can meet all criteria listed in the HSD fiscal sponsor requirements document. Fiscal sponsors are required to comply with all HSD contracting requirements and the general terms and conditions. Fiscal sponsors are required to submit financial documents as well to HSD as outlined in the application and or at the request of the RFP coordinator. Next slide, please. Michelle, we yes. have two questions in the chat. First one from Connie, can the budgets be submitted as PDFs or do they have to, to be live Excel documents? They're, they're supposed to be submitted in Excel. Okay, and then another question from Norma, would this material be sent to us? Uh, no, you have to go to the HSD website, but if you email, I can also um, send you the Excel documents as well. But we're not actually taking the initiative to send any of these documents to anyone. Okay, those are the questions that I have for now. Okay, and if any other questions come up, we'll just do them at the end because we're almost to the end. So, okay, and now I'd like to introduce Judith Panasigi to go over the rating and scoring summary. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the next few slides, I'll be speaking to um, the rating and scoring for this RFP. So the narrative portion of your application uh, will be comprised of both a core section and a strategy, strategy section. All applicants need to complete the core application questions, which includes sections A, that where you will respond to questions re related to your organization and proposed partnerships, and section B, which are questions regarding your fiscal and data management. This core section is worth up to 50 points in this RFP. And then the next sections are the primary prevention strategy questions, which is section C and section D, where you will respond to questions regarding your proposed programming and staffing. You will complete Section C if applying under the Education Programming for Youth strategy, or if you are, or complete Section D if applying under the Building Community Resiliency strategy. And if you are applying to both strategies, you will complete section, both sections C and D. And each strategy section is worth 50 points. Uh, next slide, please. So each strategy section will be scored separately with a maximum of 50 points for each section. So each strategy section where you will earn up to 50 points will be added to 
your core application section, which that is also up to 50 points. So in when you submit um, each proposal will be scored up to 100 points per proposal. So if you are applying to both strategies, you will have two proposals with a maximum of 100 points for each proposal. Your narrative responses for each section should fully answer each question, but not to exceed a total of 10 pages per strategy that you are applying to. And proposals will be evaluated against the writing criteria that is listed next to each section of the questions, which are on page 12 and 12 to 14 on the guidelines and applications. We highly rated proposals will describe how the applicant meets all of that all of the rating criteria um, that is written in the guidelines and applications. Uh, next slide. So what happens after applications are submitted? Um, the funding coordinator or Michelle will package the applications and get them to a rating panel. And the rating panel or rating committee will review your written applications. In some cases, there may be clarifying questions where the Michelle or the funding coordinator will go, may come to you um, to clarify a question that we have. And if this happens, we would then email what that question is and give you or the applicant instructions on how to respond to that question. And these type of questions are only for clarification um, and not related to any missing information or items you may have forgotten to write in your application. So after that uh, review of the written applications, the Rater Committee will make funding recommendations. And those funding recommend, recommendations um, will be reviewed and approved by the Human Services Department's director. They ultimately have the final approval of awards uh, for our investment processes. And awarded agencies will then go through a fiscal review and we will then notify, um, we'll notify agencies for uh, final awards and announce uh, those awardees to the public. Okay, thank you so much, Judith. Um, we'll go on to the next slide. And here's some tips for submitting your application. Um, refer to the application submission checklist that's on page 15. Follow the required format defined in the guidelines. Do not exceed the 10 page narrative response limit. Be specific, detailed, yet concise. Submit an accurate budget, double check your numbers, utilize the application checklist more than one time, page 17, review the online submission assistance page several times, and the link is below. Next slide, please. And here's the appeal process. Um, if you are not funded, you have the right to protest or appeal certain decisions in the award process. Um, grounds for appeals are violation of policies outlined in the funding process manual, violation of policies or failure to adhere to guidelines or published criteria and other pro procedures established in the funding opportunity. Um, the appeal deadline is four days from the date of written application status. Um, a written decision by the HSD director will be made within four business days of the receipt of the appeal. 
the HSD director's decision is final. No contracts resulting from the solicitation will be executed until the appeal process has closed. An appeal may not prevent HSD from issuing an interim contract for services to meet important client needs. Next slide, please. And again, question and answers are posted on the RFP website. Only written, published, answered on the HSD funding opportunities website are official and the link is to the right. Um, contact me at michelle.smith2 at seattle.gov with questions prior to May 13th. And any issues or questions about the online submission system will go to Sola Plumacher, who's the funding policy and process advisor. And we've listed her phone number as well. Next slide, please. And we just want to thank everyone, um, tell you all that we appreciate your efforts to create safer, healthier, more just society where all people can thrive. And we are a society that has been structured from top to bottom by race. You don't get beyond that by deciding not to talk about it anymore. It will always come back. It will always reassert itself over and over again. And that's from Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who's um, one of the founders of Intersectionality, a Black Feminist. Okay, so now we're ready for more questions if we have them. Uh, there's none at the moment, Michelle. Okay. Does anybody want to raise their hand to ask a question? give a few more minutes just in case there's something that popped up in your brain before we log off. And just so everybody knows, the slides will be emailed to you all as well as the recording and they'll also be posted on the HSD Funding Opportunities website. These are some references. Um, some links of some information, um, some of these information when used for writing the RFP is information about the socio-ecological model. Um, there's National Plan to End Gender-Based Violence, which was the first one that was issued by White House um, ever in history, which was pretty interesting. And then um, information about different approaches to prevention as well. So, Michelle, we have another question here Great. from Jenny. When will you know how many projects you will be awarding? Okay, well, the funding process, July 29th is when we'll be announcing how many awards, and that would be between two and four award. Does that answer your question? Sorry, I can't see anybody because I'm on the screen. According to Jenny, yes, thank you. Okay, you're welcome, Jenny. Well, we have a few more minutes to stay on if anybody wants to think of any other questions. Otherwise, we'll probably Mich log Michelle, off. Michelle, there's a hand raised. Oh, great. Okay, I can't see any of it, so <laughs> just let me know. Hi, Are Michelle. You sure? you this is George. Hi, how you doing? Hi, George. Um, just want to, so if you're looking at 2 to 4 projects, should we be looking at, like, you know, 1, 4th of the, the budget total in our proposals? Like, I, I, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to like gauge, like, how much of. How much should we be requesting and how big or small our project should be. Well, generally, you should just ask for the funding that you need for your specific program. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? I don't see anything here. Do you guys all want to leave and enjoy the sunshine? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was really fabulous seeing you all. 
Um, I really appreciate you all being here today and um, take advantage of the TA if you need to and um, send me any questions um, if you think of anything after this presentation. Thank you all so much. Take care. Bye everyone. Stop recording now, Ileana.